Okay, so um, I'm just before we, we we stop for lunch, I'm just going to just talk about the multitasking system for a bit because we've we've been running one program, although uh, Mark there has actually run one program twice, run two copies of it, um, which is possible. And this is this is all achieved by having a multitasking system. We can actually have multiple programs running at the same time. Um, so why do we want to do that? Well. We can have multiple functions on the machine. Typically, a machine does have lots of different functions on it, so it makes sense to split it up into different, uh, different sort of um, program functions as well. Um, some of those functions will have to run one after the other. Some of them might be running concurrently, where they're, they're running in parallel. So that allows us to do that. <coughs> Typically, we might have a power-up sequence, which would involve our startup program. We've just been uh, been looking at. After power up on the typical machine, you might want to home the axes because um, a lot of times, especially these have incremental encoders, so on power up you don't know where they are, so you have to go and find some known position uh, to home it. We would probably want on a machine to have something that's monitoring any errors going on and either simply reporting the errors, flashing a light or, or just stopping it, or even trying to correct the machine if there have been some errors to go through some sequence to uh, to try and perform some kind of error error correction. Uh, and then the main parts of the machine itself could be split up into different things like the main motion part of it, HMI handling, some kind of mini PLC going on where you've got some IO being handled. So there's lots of opportunities for, for doing things in parallel uh, should you need to. And the multitasking gives us a great way to do all of that. So we can divide up tasks into something that's sort of fairly specific. Um, e even if you have a large machine, you might have an, an input side of it which maybe has three motors on working together. That could be defined as a task that's running the input side and a middle bit of the machine with a certain number of motors and an output part of the machine with a certain number of motors. And you might well split it up so that one program runs the in input side, one program runs the the main bit in the middle and another program as the output side. Uh, but it's all down to, to particular machines really. Um, error handling we can do uh, stuff to, to look for errors and even, even these days where we can communicate to the server drives we can actually pick up error messages from the drives if, if you program that in uh, and report all that up to an HMI. Um, or even these, these days up to the cloud so that someone on the other side of the world can see what's going on. Now our, our operating system is, is, is not like Windows. Windows. Windows does multitasking, you can, you can open a Word and, and have Outlook running and you can, you can have various things all running at the same time in your PC, same in your phone, you know, your phone can be running, watching a YouTube video and at the same time it's getting emails in. Um, this is all to do with multitasking. With, that, with our system it's, it's designed to effectively keep running. So there's not so much error trapping in it in terms of what the multitasking does. So if, if, you, um, if you run two programs, the two programs actually will not be aware of the other one running. There's, there's nothing in this program as it runs along. If this tries to um, turn a motor clockwise and this one tries to turn the same motor anti-clockwise, they'll both do it and they won't know the other one's doing the other. Yeah. So there's no, there's no kind of communication between the, the between the processes, um, unlike in Windows, if if you try to uh, in Windows try to um, open a serial port, I know we don't have COM ports these days, but if you try to open a COM port with one bit of software and then try to do it with another bit of software, it say no, you can't. That one's already in use. You know, we, we used to have this where our software was resident on an Alan Bradley occupied PLC uh, PC because the Alan Bradley software, as soon as you start the PC, it says right, COM port, I've got that. And it does it right from the word go. And then when, when we try to start Motion Perfect, Motion Perfect goes, oh, there's no COM port. But it's only because the Alan Bradley software's basically occupied it and right. taken over. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no checking like that in, in, in our controller. So two programs try to control the serial port, yep, yeah, they can do it. But if one sends the word hello and the other sends the word goodbye, what comes out of the serial port would be H-E-G-O-L-L, -L, you know, O-D. It would just mash it all up because um, there's no controls on it. 
<coughs> command line, of course, is a real benefit to uh, to us. What I mean by the command line here is actually that means the entire Motion Perfect connection. So while we're running all our other programs, Motion Perfect can can hook in there and uh, and can tell us what's going on and allow us to do uh, sort of real time debugging. All of this, when I started with Trio, was was almost impossible because we only had a, a controller that ran one program, uh, and if you wanted to connect the software to it, which was in DOS, you had to stop the program before you could do the connection. It would only do one thing. Mm -hmm. And now we take all this for granted. It's uh, like I say, all of our phones, all of our PCs have this anyway. <coughs> okay, uh, a few words. Um, I've used the word process on the previous slide rather than task because IEC programming language, the, the, the PLC language, has taken the word task to have a specific meaning. So when you talk about a task, that's an IEC task. So a process is one of our multitasking slots that could be running BASIC or it could be running the PLC or it could be running, if we decide to use another language in the future, it could be running another language. Okay. Um, I got you putting run something comma zero and something comma one, didn't I? To, to run our specific, those are called processes. Um, and each controller has a maximum number allowed. So zero is the first one, and then whatever the maximum is will be the top. On these, the maximum one is nine. Yeah. On the 664, the maximum is 21. Yeah. And on a lot of our high-end controllers, it's 21. On our lowest range controller, the, the 403, it's only 0 to 5, 6, yeah. 5. I think it's 0 to 5, is it? Yeah. Because it's 6 five, processes. Six processes. Yeah. 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 Um, and you can see here I've, I've got quite a cluttered, you know, there's a lot of programs here, and I'm running a few of them, but you can, can see that this little triangle that appears here. If you click that, it actually shows you the process number it's running on. So you can see there I've got main running on 1, uh, motion 1 is running on 21, and uh, something called printer is running on 20. Okay, that's the list of uh, different process numbers that uh, are available on the different controllers. Um, I think that's up to date, isn't it? I don't think there's any more. Until Fred finishes the 404, then yeah. we'll have to add that to the list. Okay, and then just going back to how we might configure things, you have one program that runs on power up, say called, I call it main, could be called initialize or whatever. Uh, that then is, is going to be running the other program. So it runs the startup, runs some ladder logic maybe, and then runs various other different programs as needed. But the important thing is that this one called main will continue to run all the time, even if the others stop we want this one to stay running. So you need to really write that with that in mind so it won't suddenly stop or quit because there's some error because it should be monitoring errors in the other programs. <coughs> um, we can look at what's running. Under the directory link in this menu here, there's, there's a processes menu. So when we look at that, we can see what processes are running. It'll tell us what line number it's on um, and uh, how many percentage of the CPU it's using, which is sometimes useful. This particular picture is taken from a 664, so it's a multi-core processor. So it's actually also telling us what core it's running on. So you can see the one called main running there is taking 100% of the time on core number two. Uh, printer's paused and is taking 0%, and motion one there is sleeping, which is taking 2%. So we would pause a program like that by pressing this step button, for example. Uh, sleeping, so what's sleeping? Um, a sleeping program is, is kind of useful because it means when something, the program's doing not much, just waiting for something, it, it's giving up its processing time to other stuff. So it allows other things to run faster. Okay. And what puts a program to sleep are those three commands there. So either a WA with a time in milliseconds, or if you're waiting for a, an axis to finish, wait idle, or waiting for an axis to be loaded with a, with a move. So th those three there will actually put a program to sleep. 
other things though um, if, if you put something where you're doing weight and filling expression that that doesn't have the same effect so this here weight until something equals whatever that does not put it to sleep it continues to process that all the time so it's just using up processing time doing that doing that expression and check so you've got to be a little bit careful because if you say wait, wait idle, that puts it to sleep. If you say wait until idle, that doesn't. It's a different, different situation. Um, okay, so in the multitasking itself, we, we, we tend to run, obviously uh, we, we're doing servo loops and, and servo control and motion. We've got to do that on a very strict time basis. So every millisecond or every servo cycle, typically a millisecond, the first thing that happens is all the servos are done and the motion is done. So all that's processed so that the next part of the move can be, can be happening. Uh, and you'd be surprised, even if there's a one millisecond break in, 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 a, in a move, you would see it. You might even hear it in the servo motor. There'd be a little tiny dink sound or knocking sound as there's a slight disjoint in the, in the motion being processed. So it's very important that that is processed every millisecond without fail. Um, and that, that's really what our system is designed to do. Now when it's finished doing the servo, servos in motion, whatever time is left over is given to your programs, okay, in, in the multitasking. And uh, <clears throat> obviously the more motion processing you're doing, that increases that amount of time and it reduces the amount of time given over to programs. But don't worry, it's really fast. The processes are so fast you, you, you hardly see this effect at all. Um, uh, unless you're someone, uh, one of our Chinese customers who buys the cheapest controller and tries to do the biggest machine. In that case, they do start to run into some of these issues. Um, you can read the amount of time taken in a, in a servo cycle with system load for, for the servers and motion. So you can read that back. Um, and generally, uh, the more axes you put in, the higher the system load will go. And it will, it'll peak a little bit if you do a really complex type of move. For example, launching, um, uh, launching a cam or launching a, a flex link or something where there's a lot of processing needed as the move starts. You'll get little peaks in system load. So momentarily it might just go up and then down again. But again, you, you would never see this in, in reality. It, would, it wouldn't cause a detrimental effect really on your, on your programs. Now one thing that will affect the, uh, your programs a lot would be is if you decide you want to close the loop much faster. Now a one millisecond default there, we've, we've got servers of motion taking, what would you say, about 15% of the total time and the rest of it's left for the, the multitasking. If I go to 500 microseconds, of course I've got to do that twice every, every millisecond. So now my, my total time available for my basic programs is now a little less, isn't it? because I've basically doubled up that bit, so squeeze that. So my my programs, and don't forget it's not only your programs, it's also comms over ethernet. All that has to be processed in this part here. That's now gonna run a bit slower. Now if I go to 250, look, it really gets much worse. So when we when we get customers who say, oh, you know, I, I must close my loop at, at some crazy fast rate, you say, okay, fine, you can do that but don't expect peak performance and all the other stuff because it is going to affect it. Yeah. And there are not many real systems where you need to get down to this level. I mean, you're talking about lifting masses on or, or people on, on, on hoists. A millisecond's fast enough. They're not going to go very far in a millisecond. They're inertia. <coughs> so that's one, one little effect of, uh, say, increasing the, uh, the uh, servo rate. Um, in the multitasking, we've, we've got a concept of two process uh, types. There's a fast one, and uh, I've called it in the slide slow. Um, my boss prefers it to be called level. He's decided level is a good word for the other type. So there's fast and level. You might see the reason for this. He doesn't like the word slow. Well, okay, I can understand that. So I've got three programs running there see the process numbers 20, 21 and 19 and what's happening is that 20 and 21 are my fast ones 
which are shades of grey here, these two, uh, and then one slow process or level process as it's known, uh, which is that one, and then actually a quarter of that has to be given over to the system, so there's a system process running all the time, and what that's doing, it's actually doing the comms, so it's got the ether ethernet stuff in it, it's got stuff, if you're running CAN bus, it's got CAN bus in it, so it's got all the stuff the system needs to be running in the background. Not the motion, the motion has its own special place, but everything else that runs in the background is in the system slot there. Um, so that's fairly even, isn't it? So I've only got three programs running, but there, there's actually three places it can run every millisecond. By the way, it doesn't mean that, nothing, nothing in this means that if I've got a program written, in, in that time there, it will go from top to bottom of the program. We have no defined scan rates. It will simply run as much of, as many of the lines of the program as it can in that time that it's given. So if that's 25% of whatever milliseconds it is, it might run 30 lines of code. If they're very complex lines of code, it might only run 10. But that's that's definitely and then and basically everything gets put on the stack and it carries on. Then the next time it gets a, a processing slot, it'll continue. So what you see is is the programs running continuously. What's actually happening is they're being cut up in in time uh, very very rapidly. Um, but we're talking about sort of average times here. So if I add a fourth program here, so I've got my two fast ones, remember they're the highest two, 20 and 21, and two slow ones, or level ones, um, they have to share just one of the quarters. So my two fast ones always get that, and my others all have to share that one. So if I run two fast ones and 10 of the others, they all have to share this little slice here, which means obviously they're they're only going to get processed once every tenth millisecond, effectively. Um, one, one in ten milliseconds. So sometimes it's um, it's better not to use the fast task. If you have no reason to do this, and the only real real reason for wanting a fast task, there's two reasons actually. One, one reason would be you're waiting for some kind of input to come on and you need to respond really fast. Yeah. The other reason might be that this is something to do with comms or mod modbus or something and you want that to be processed really quickly. Um, <coughs> so to, to give it a higher priority to, to allow the comms to be rapid. <coughs> but if you don't want that, if that's not necessary, it's actually a better strategy to, to run everything on the same level as slow processes. So you can see here I've got four running. On the previous slide I think I had four running actually, didn't I? I've got four running there, duh, 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 but these are running slower. But here I've got four running and they've all, all got an equal slice. So you just you just equally let them all have the same level. That's why my boss wants to call it level because they're all on the same level. Um, so you've just got that two two tier system really. That there's no difference between a program running on process one compared to process seven. They're running on the same level. It's only the top two that have any difference, and in your systems that's eight and nine. Notice the system process always gets its slice, whatever, so it, it carries on. It doesn't share with nobody or anybody, should I say. Now we can read the processes in, uh, in the terminal. If I type the word process, I'll, I'll read them all like that. Um, and you can see here that actually it's listing not only the our user programs running, so we've got startup and two other programs there. It's actually showing you all of the system stuff as well, which probably isn't too much interest to you, but it kind of gives you an impression of the fact, for example, nearly 5% here is being taken up by the TCP IP server, this is for the Ethernet, and nearly 5% is being taken up by the EtherCAT on this one, doing some processing. Um, something called a display manager, I have no idea what that is, apart from it might be the LED display, LCD display. Um, MPE is the motion perfect connection, so that's taking up 5% as well. And the protocol scheduler, this is the bit that actually schedules between, no it isn't, I have a big one. Protocol scheduler is to do with protocols. Uh, not sure, don't know. But it, it, it's to do with communications anyway. So as you hear, a lot of that's to do with communications. Um, 
This particular one isn't using any canvas, so you see the can canvas server here is actually using zero. So you get an idea of what's going on anyway. Um, we don't have a huge influence over this and, and you know, trying to adjust things and make them run uh, in different priorities. With, with some fairly expert knowledge, you can change how things will run, um, but it's really beyond the scope of this course. Yeah. It is possible to give like more time to this bit and less time to your user programs, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's best just to leave it to sort itself out. Really, it, it does a fairly good job most of the time. Okay, there's the system processes, and of course the kernel bit. This is our motion processing, so that that stands out on its own. That always always has uh, its own amount of running. So, <clears throat> if we run a, a system with a, for example, we if we run an EtherCAT system with say 20 axes on, you'd expect that maybe to be more like 50 percent because you're running a lot more axes. Okay, the uh, the multi-core things. Um, so our our Flexix Nano and our MC6N both have a two-core processor, and the the uh, sort of tasks are split up like this. So we've got servers in motion on one core, and all of our basic programs I was just talking about actually run on their own core. So in this case, because it's got two process cores, as we increase the number of axes on here, and this goes up, it doesn't have any effect on that. So that's the benefit of having two cores. This bit called system tasks here, uh, we can allocate that to a number of different things. That's, that's kind of variable. One of the things we sometimes do, we, we've done this for a customer recently, is We've allocated all the Ethernet stuff into here, so it speeds up his Ethernet comms because he was trying to I don't know, trying to send so much data in a, in a short time to us. <coughs> so we, we we kind of we can manipulate this bit, um, but that bit there is the same as it is in the single core. Now the four core one, um, if we go to that, then we end up with obviously four cores, and what happens there is. We put the system process in its own core, so that's doing all the Ethernet and all the other stuff. Servers are motion in a core, and then our user programs are split between two cores. And what happens there is that the fast tasks are, are allocated. You have one fast task in here and one in there, and then all of the others uh, share some remaining time in both of those. So uh, if you think of the, if you had a fast task and two fast tasks and, and two slow ones, or four slow ones, say, the fast tasks would take 50% of each of those and then the slow ones would share the remaining 50% of each. <coughs> and again, it improves performance, of course, at a price. And there's a, a screenshot of uh, doing the process command on a multi-core controller. So you can see the um, Server scheduler is on one, so that's the system task, is it? No. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the server, this is the motion bit. Server scheduler is the most motion bit, so that's running on one core. Then all the system stuff's running on core zero, and then the user programs are running on three and two. So how does that affect us? Uh, you write programs and you run them and it just runs them. So no normally everything you do processes fast enough for you not to worry about anything I've just told you. Um, but we do run in occasionally to situations where users are trying to get an awful lot out of the controller and then you have to start thinking about exactly how these tasks are running with each other. <coughs> um, when, when you write a program you want it to move stuff so you will be obviously writing a program that does moves. What happens when you get to a move in the program is that it's transferred into the motion part. So when you get to the command move, it will actually go into here. You'll see it appear in that part there. Instead of idle, it would say move or forward or whatever the command is. And once it's in there, it's using the preset parameters that you've put in there, okay, which we've already been setting up some gains, for example. Um, so the, the motion part runs really on its own, completely, almost like it's a separate, um, a separate device in some ways. So when, when your program comes down and does a move, so you come down here, set the speed axle, do a move there, 
that move initially goes into the program's own buffer and in there it, it is then signaled to the motion system to say hey I've got move for you and then the motion system will go okay I'm free that axis is not doing anything give me the move and the move goes across there first into something called the next move buffer and then if the if the main buffer move buffer is, is available it'll just go straight into there and then it starts to run so so this bit here this velocity profile unit is the bit that does the actual motion um, and then the servo control part of it that we've been looking at tuning that takes these millisecond by millisecond a new demand position goes into here uh, and is used to control the actual position of the motor and that's basically the sequence so the two the two boxes here the one on the right hand side and the middle one uh, what's called deterministic they're running the in the main kernel once per millisecond and then the bit that's running the basic we have no um, we have no kind of specification of exactly how many lines of code it will run it just runs quite fast but I can we can never actually say how long it will take those to run those four lines of code it is quite variable but let me assure you it's it's fast enough you know, it will run far quicker than any machine that, uh, that you're trying to control any questions about all of that it's a little bit technical uh, actually uh, we had experience about the application uh, they called transfer machine okay the transfer machine use uh, several multi-axis parts for example one two axes do the drilling mm -hmm. the next station actually the station just moving and the work is moving between exchanging the position between the different stations mm -hmm. and the next station do some tapping for example yeah yeah and the next station do some engraving for okay. example so the same part mm -hmm. exchanging stations yes into the machine and then finally the final piece go out of the machine mm -hmm. unloading by robot or something like that yeah yeah so in that application they use something like maximum 21 axis 22 axis mm -hmm. in the same machine in different multi-axis stations yes so in that case uh, can we use for example for 21 axis which kind of controller can be useful to use in that machine with the minimum price i mean um well, the flex 6 should run 21 axis okay yeah only the cat that should work yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um i would i would imagine you you're not going to have You've got 21 axes, but you've not got 21 workstations around that. So your, your number of programs you need to run, I, I would suggest you're running one program for each uh, each station. action, each station. Yeah. But maybe there's 10 stations. Yeah, something like Some that. have one axis, yeah. some have two axes, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and everything coordinated by one main program that's that's doing the, the main sort of transfer time. Yeah, they're running at yeah. the same time, but yeah. should be in the different tasks. Like yeah. That. Yeah, no, that, that, that would. So the Flex 6 Nano? quite. Flex 6 Nano would do that, I would have thought. It's really the number of axes that governs what uh, what controller you pick. So, not not necessarily the number of workstations or whatever, it's the number of axes. Okay. Yeah, yeah.